not dropping those. <laughs> Too expensive. Hi, this is Misha, and you just saw us firing this rifle here. This is a South African Vector with a K LM5. This is a pretty uncommon rifle in the USA with only a few here, at least legally. To get into some history though, you notice this looks a lot like a Galil. It's because it basically is. The South African Defense Force originally adopted a version of the FNFAL as the R1. They tested it out in the late 50s along with other 7.62 NATO guns of the era such as the AR-10 and an early HKG-3. And they selected the FAL as their next standard issue gun. It was going to replace mostly older infields and things that have been in service since long before World War II in South Africa. They set up a factory known as Littleton Engineering. They did have British assistance in doing this, at least the British claim so. And the R1 would go into production around 1960. It was officially adopted and then into production a short time later. Now the first R1s were built in F, excuse me, built by FN in Belgium. Then they would build some in South Africa using Belgian parts. And then they would transition fully over to South African R1s by the late 60s. Well, in 1963, there was a voluntary United Nations arms embargo in sending guns into South Africa. It was voluntary, though, so com companies could or couldn't, uh, if they, you know, whatever they want to do, countries could. I mean, but this was made permanent and mandatory in 1977. So this forced South Africa to develop a domestic firearms industry. Also around 77, the, the R1's getting a little long in the tooth. I mean, they only adopted it, you know, less than two decades earlier, but 223, 556, NATO had come onto the scene, so on and so forth. What they ended up doing was purchasing a license to manufacture under contract the Galil ARM from IMI, Israeli Military Industries. Now, they would adopt this as the R4. The R4 was a modified ARM. Now, the first R4s were basically Israeli-made Galils. But soon, the R4 distinctive features would come out. Some would include a larger front sight ring, a smaller front sight post, a different gas tube, a longer handguard. They would still have the bipod from the from the ARM, but they would not have the carry handle. They would also introduce a long, well, longer stock for the R4, and which would be carried over to later versions like this one. There was a couple of different patterns. Most were steel cord with a polymer coating to save on weight. This is the single piece design where the butt plate is part. There is another type with the rubber butt plate that's a separate piece on this. The R4 was officially adopted in 1982 in South Africa by the Defense Forces. It had an 18-inch barrel. As I said, it had a bipod. It had polymer handguards and the other changes we talked about. We'll, we'll flash up some pictures. After adopting the full-size rifle, they would also adopt the R5, which was the carbine version, which is closer to what I'm holding here. The R5, made by Littleton, later to be called, well, becoming called Vector, again with a K, not Vector in Salt Lake City, different company, would have a 13-inch barrel, 
no bipod, and a slightly shorter gas system. It was essentially exactly like a Glial SAR. Now after having the carbine and the rifle, these are going to service throughout the 80s as they started to ramp up production. The standard R4 was, well, standard issue in the Army. However, the South African Navy and Air Force, as, well, as well as some police forces, uh, MP type stuff, would tend to gravitate more towards the carbine R5. These are not necessarily large, but they are all metal, pretty heavy guns. We have a milled receiver just like a Galil. We have all the pretty much same features of a Galil. We have the upswept charging handle. We have the ambidextrous thumb safety. Here. We have the rear sight mounted on the top cover with the middle position for a flip up night sight. Here. There's a matching sight here on uh, this. You see it has the large ring. This post is a finer diameter than on a glial. Now this has the big hoop which is correct for an R5 type on the gas tube. The R4 has a lip, so it's a little different. The hand guards on this are almost identical to Israeli. Now these will not have the scope mount like most Israelis would. Instead, they would just have a second lightning cut as early Galils did. Again, very much like a Valmet receiver, too. And of course, the stock folds. Most of these tend to be stiff. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. Not too bad. Let's see the stock folded. Making it pretty compact. So we have the R4 and the R5 in South Africa. And they would introduce a semi automatic version of each for mostly domestic sales. There was the LM4. Some automatic R4 and the LM5, this one here, semi automatic version of the R5. Now, the original South African LM5 would still have the 13 inch barrel. It just mostly would be the same gun, just uh, not select fire. And built from the factory from the beginning to be semi auto. So, how did these come into the country? It took me a lot of time to figure this out. In 1985, early in the year, a company that's been defunct for a long time called TNT imported some sample batches of the LM1, which was the FAL R1 semi-auto only, and the LM5. There also might have been a few LM4s. We're talking maybe a total of 20 guns for samples to show it, say, you know, trade shows, send to the ATF, so on and so forth. The plan was to import South African FALs and Galil type guns to compete with, uh, you know, the original IMI, FN guns, as well as other companies like Springfield, who were doing at the time the SAR-48 FAL made by Imbel from Brazil, and they were doing the SAR-3 G3 type made in Greece by Hellenic. So there was, there, was a, there was a good business model. It worked. It was a way to get some quality guns for a much lesser price. Unfortunately, as we all know, South Africa has had political troubles, especially going back that far. In October of 1985, President Reagan at the time put sanctions on doing business with South Africa. So obviously this put a very quick end to TNT's idea to bring over South African rifles, leaving only a few samples in this country. I don't have an LM1, but a friend does, and I've seen a couple of other LM5s floating around too. I don't know if there are any LM4s that would be really neat. There probably are a couple, but I haven't run across them yet. So we just thought we would uh, shoot this and show this. If you notice, the stock is incredibly long. This makes a NATO link stock on a um, Arsenal look short. They went to a very long stock on the whole series. 
for South African soldiers, which I guess are generally speaking taller. <laughs> they also, interesting fact, the original serial number is here on the bottom of the gas block, which is part of the barrel. In South Africa, the barrel is the firearm, not the receiver. Now for import to the USA, they had to add a serial number to the receiver and there is a factory serial number applied at the bottom of the receiver here. Also for the USA, they had to put on an extension taking the 13 inch barrel out to 16. This is a factory applied extension. Now, it, it got loose over time, so I had a friend uh, re, re pin it and re weld it just for to be doubly safe that it would never come off. Because when it came in, it was pretty lightly welded on, honestly. So I had a friend redo that just to, to be safe. So they had to make a few changes to get it into the country. Obviously, taking the original flash hider off and putting this extended one on doesn't really change anything. These never had bayonet lugs in military service. And actually, the, the R5 could never wa launch uh, rifle grenades. The, the R4 could, but the R5's barrel was, uh, was too short for rifle grenades. This is a very high quality gun, very similar to uh, an Israeli, but it's, it's a licensed copy, licensed uh, contract clone. It runs great. <clears throat> it does have a, see, very long. <laughs> It does have an interesting firing pin. The original Israeli Galil had a free-floated firing pin because it was based on the Kalashnikov. Later, they would go to a spring-loaded pin to prevent slam fires. Vector in South Africa, Littleton, had a different solution. They put a little uh, rubber, uh, looks like almost like a pencil eraser, in the bolt, which cushioned the firing pin and pushed it back. They, it was actually the same rubber that they made the uh, butt plate out of. This isn't the original stock to this gun, I have it, but the butt plate, and you can, any folks out there in South Africa can attest to this too, that rubber, whatever they used or whatever grease or oil they stored these in, eroded that rubber. When we got this, you know, it was, um, the original rubber parts were just, they were there, they were just brittle and not just, they were crumbling apart. This included the buffer in the bolt, the buffer in the back of the receiver, which is thankfully the same as most Galil's, and the rubber recoil pad. I've looked for a replacement recoil pad for the original stock, haven't found one yet, so I put on just a standard R4, R5 single piece stock, which is the same, the difference is just the back. So that's kind of an interesting thing, I don't know why the rubber deteriorated so quickly, only being made back in the 80s, but it did. Well, that was pretty much the short, very, very short import history of the LM series into the US. Today, the R4, R5 are still standard issue in South Africa. They've also introduced the R6. Many consider this a micro Galil. It's really not. It's kind of in between the micro Galil and the SAR. It's shorter than an SAR, but it's still longer than a micro and it doesn't quite have all the adaptations of a micro. The, the R6 is South Africa's own thing. In recent history, Littleton Vector has been renamed into Denel, and actually in 2016 they received a contract from the South African government to modernize, refurbish, and update all the R4 and R5s still in service. So they've been uh, doing this, it's supposed to take about three years, so they probably will still be doing it for another couple of years now. And so South Africa is still planning to keep the R4 and R5 in service, at least until 2020. They have said they will look into modern alternatives to replace it, but for the foreseeable future, this is going to be a standard issue. Well, we, do, we wanted to bring something kind of unique to you today. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please post them below. If you like the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed, well, you know the routine. We really appreciate it if you could, if you have time. As always, this is Misha. And please, please tune in again next time for more hopefully interesting and neat videos. We'll catch you then.